Hey everybody, Pumpkin here. So we have some more cards to review. Uh, I did two videos earlier. I did a 15 card review and a three card review. So this one's gonna be a little bit bigger. It's about, it's a little over 20 cards. So um, hopefully I won't miss any. Um, I might redo another card if I forgot that I've done it in the past. So, because they, they don't really have an order for this. So I will do my best to only do new ones. Um, so yeah, let's get right into it. Um, at the start, we have Devil's Puffball. This is a five provision neutral. Uh, damage a unit by two and give a give it poison. Death will give poison to adjacent units. Um, so this is the first non tall poison card that we've seen so far. The other poison cards that we've seen so far are uh, the Dryad Ranger and the Forest Whisperer. Um, it, it's really hard to evaluate poison right now simply because... We don't know what the meta is going to be like. If the meta is really wide, poison is pretty bad because you're killing like fours and fives and that's not great. Um, if the meta, however, is very uh, tall, so like a Garnacora meta or like a Woodland meta, uh, this card can actually be pretty good. Um, you can also use this with synergy with the new Scoia'tael trap, uh, Tree and Mantis. Um, the idea would be you play Tree and Mantis, they play a card, it flips over, it gets the poison effect. And then you could use something like Brewer Dragoon. You could move it, uh, another large unit next to the target of the Mantis. And then you could Devil Puffball. And because it's Death Blow give adjacent unit poison, um, and because it gives you poison the first time, no matter how large the unit that they play is for Treant Mantis, it'll always kill the unit because it is stacking the second tick of poison. It will kill that, uh, and then it'll poison the other card, and then you can use something like Dryad Ranger on it. Um, another suggestion was like, oh, you could play this with Francesca. That's really good. Nah, not really, because it, it really only works if your opponent plays multiple large units next to each other. And if this ever does become meta, people will just play large units next to small units uh, or like in between artifacts or whatever. So I, I think this card is good in a poison deck because it is a poison card. Um, I think that's pretty straightforward. But in terms of poison itself as a mechanic, I don't think it'll be that good. Uh, and this is, all of this is um, without even talking about status removal. So um, you can purify a unit and remove the poison. So if there's like any amount of purify running around, then poison's really bad. So um, yeah, super meta dependent, but I, I don't think poison's going to be that good. I, 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 I would love it to be good because I like the concept, uh, but I don't think it's that good. Um, you might play like two Dryad Rangers in the deck simply because... Uh, you threaten the poison, and it's a four for five, and it has harmony, and that's not that bad. So, um, so yeah, the card. I mean, the animation is probably gonna be really cool. Um, sadly, I don't think poison's gonna be that good, but we'll see. Next card, Undying Thirst. This is a neutral card. Um, four provisions give an enemy unit bleeding for six turns. So this is very, very similar to uh, Feast of Blood. Feast of Blood is strictly better because you can purify a unit if you control a vampire. Uh, this one you cannot. Um, and it should be that way, right? Faction cards should always be better than neutrals. Um, I don't think Bleed's going to be that good because it does take six turns to go off. Purify is uh, something that exists. On top of that, finding a six can be difficult. Uh, it's also really bad in the short round. So maybe like an all-in monster deck that just wants to play every Bleed card and you play this card. Um, what I am excited for with this card is the fact that it is a four provision special. Um, we don't have a lot of four provision specials. Uh, the ones that we do have are like Dime Bomb and like Clear Skies. These cards that are, they're tech cards. We're actually seeing Dime Bomb uh, a, a decent amount in SK because they just discarded away. But in terms of actually playing the card, um, you don't see any of these cards in decks because if they brick, it's a zero. You can do it in SK because you just discard. Um, but in a, in a non SK deck that can just throw away the cards for free, um, you can't really afford to play a lot of these 4P cards that are specials. But now they're introducing a bunch of these. So I'm very excited because it means that I can play no unit decks. Um, maybe you remember back in uh, the beginning of open beta, there was a spell -a -tell where you didn't play any units in round one uh, until the very end. And you just play a ton of specials. Well, I mean, this definitely pushes the archetype. Uh, you can play this in like a Siri Nova list. Um, the idea is you don't want to play any units, only specials in Siri Nova, and Siri Nova keeps coming back every turn. Um, it's pretty gimmicky. I don't think it'll be anywhere near tier one, tier two, but it is a fun deck. Um, we actually saw this deck appear with like Phoenix and Siri Nova 
back at the beginning of Homecoming. The problem is uh, that deck ran specials and artifacts, and specials and artifacts kept getting nerfed every patch. So eventually that deck kind of died. So maybe this is enough. This and a couple other specials that are coming out to push uh, the Siri Nova deck. So I'm definitely looking forward to that. But outside of that deck and like an all-in bleed deck, I don't think this card's going to see a lot of play. I think it's too weak. It takes too long to get value. And once again, if um, Purify is something that's being run, uh, this card's really bad. Uh, Spring Equinox. So this is for provisions, another special uh, neutral. Purify all units on a row. Um, purifying removes locks, vitality, bleed, poison, shield, immunity, doomed. Um, it removes all of those. So an example, this is this and Celiac, the Nilfgaard, 5 Strength, 7 Provision, are the two only cards at the moment that uh, have AoE Purify, meaning they don't target. You just target a row or in Celiac's ability or a case, uh, it's AoE. So this can remove immunity because you're not actually targeting the unit. Normal Purify cards such as, let's say, uh, Imperial Diviner, you can't really Purify an immune unit because you can't target the immune unit in the first place, whereas uh, Spring Equinox you can. So yes, you can re remove immunity, but I don't think it's good. So the problem with this card is it's zero, provi or it's zero tempo. You're playing this for four and you're doing nothing for an entire turn. That's really bad. Typically, playing zero points is not a good play. Um, there, there is a scenario where like, if there's an Aridin deck that's absolutely insane, you need to run this, maybe. Um, the, there, there is one case where I actually think this card will see play, uh, and that's Beast SK. So in Beast SK, you want as many beasts in your graveyard for uh, Bear Master. What's cute about this card is Germain spawns four cows. Now the four cows are doomed, but if you spring Equinox that row, um, they become un they become undoomed. So your Bear Masters actually count those four cows. Is that good? Well, plus four on Bear Masters is pretty good, especially because you typically play three, two regular, and then one Freya. So getting roughly twelve points is pretty solid. But you can go even further. You can play Morkvarg, right? Morkvarg is a beast. Uh, the problem is it normally doesn't count for Bear Master because it's doomed. Well, if you spring Equinox it, it is no longer doomed. Uh, and then that's another plus one. Uh, is that good? Okay, now we're looking at plus five per Bear Master. You're looking at a roughly 15 points. That's pretty good. That's a lot of points. Um, assuming tall removal isn't a thing and assuming like Erden isn't meta or any other kind of like AOE resets, that could actually be really good. Um, also, you have to remember, yes, it is zero tempo. If you win coin flip and you go second, tempo doesn't matter. You can literally just play Jermaine and then play this. Or play Jermaine, use Brand, discard your Morkvarg, and then play this. Um, you don't care about tempo when you win coin flip. So 50% of the time, you could play zero points and go for uh, more points in round three. Uh, and then the other 50% of the time, when you don't win coin flip, well, you're playing Brand. You just discard it, right? You just get rid of it. Um, because you have discard card. You, you don't actually have to play this card. So I, I, I think this actually might see some play in the Beast SK deck. Outside of the Beast SK deck, I don't think this card will see much play. Yeah. Moving on. We talked about Dryad Ranger. Centri... Centri... I can't pronounce anything. Centri... Centrian Knight. Uh, this is an NR card. Four provisions, two strength, deploy, melee, damage a unit by two, death blow, gain vitality for two turns. Uh, so this is a strictly better wolf pack. We're seeing some power creep on wolf pack. Uh, wolf pack is a two that deals two for four. This is a two that deals two for four. And if you kill the unit, you get plus two. Well, okay, you get vitality too. So you get instantly plus one at the end of your turn. Uh, and then you get a potential plus one if your opponent doesn't kill the card. Uh, and most of the time your opponent isn't going to do three damage to kill this because spending removal to kill this to deny one point probably isn't worth it so like if you're playing Squayatel and you have a panther you're probably not going to panther this because you want to save that panther for a different engine um so generally the second vitality proc will go off um yeah this card is very good well it's strictly better than wolf pack and it potentially is a six so the question is is how many twos are there going to be in the game uh, if we notice there, there's, there's a few twos right here um 
It seems like Deathblow 2 is very, 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 very common in this. Ex oh, actually, this is 3. I actually forgot about that. Um, Deathblow 2 is very popular right now. Um, to the point where I don't know if you can play two drops. Um, I'll get into this a little bit more when we come over here. But uh, since Deathblow 2 is going to be so popular, um, it might be too risky to run any kind of two drops because you're just going to essentially be giving your opponent uh, easy targets for their Deathblow cards. So if that is the case, I guess you don't play this card because, well, it's, well, it's actually not a two, it's a three. Hmm. Okay, never mind. This card's fine. Um, it doesn't work against Croc, but whatever. It's not a big deal. Um, yeah, this card's pretty good. Unless nobody runs twos. If, if everybody drops all the twos out of their deck, um, it's going to be kind of harder to find those twos because, well, NR has damage, but they need to... F the, the way they find the damage is they set up uh, engines. And if your opponent removes all the engines, you'll never find the two. So I think it'll be contingent on how many twos are being run. If, if all of these twos are being run, uh, then this card will definitely be a good card. Moving on, uh, SK, four provisions, two strength, uh, deploy melee, damage an enemy by two, bloodthirst two, give the enemy damage by the student, bleeding for two turns. So a little different from the other cards that have death blow. Um, it's a it's a wolf pack two that deals two, and then if you have bloodthirst, so if your opponent has two damaged enemies, uh, it gives the target that you did two damage to uh, bleed two. So it can do up to four damage to a target. Um, it's not, I mean, it's strictly better than Wolf Pack. So if you're playing Wolf Pack and you normally discard Wolf Pack, well, this is strictly better. So if you're playing Wolf Pack, you have this card now. Um, is it good enough to see play? Yeah. Why not? It, it, it's not terrible. Uh, a lot of times it'll just be fodder for your discard cards. But every now and then, if you play this and you um, fulfill the uh, requirement... You're getting good value. Yeah, I think this card will see play in SK. Basically, just whatever deck that you were running that had Wolfpack in it, replace it with this. Uh, moving on, Brusa. Bruxa. Um, this is a monster card for provisions to strength. Deploy damage an enemy by two. Deathblow gain thrive. So another Deathblow 2 gain X. Um, this is very similar to... I'm blanking out. Drowner, thank you. Um, this is very similar to Drowner, uh, other than the fact that it's 1p uh, cheaper and it doesn't have the movement, but it's a conditional thrive. Um, I don't think this card will see any play because as I mentioned earlier, uh, dealing two damage for Deathblow, it seems like it's a very popular thing and I think people are going to run it. So like any SK deck that's playing Croc is gonna be running Primal Savagery because it's good. Uh, and because it's not just Deathblow 2, it's technically Deathblow 3 because you have Croc. Um, and if this card's getting run everywhere, uh, it means cards like this will never, ever survive. Um, if you compare this to another card, Necker Warrior, Necker Warrior is a 4 for 4 that also has Thrive. The difference between this and that is uh, the Necker Warrior is guaranteed to have Thrive. Uh, and it's a bigger body, which means it's harder to kill outside of like Malayan, uh, Frit, Chironex. Um, the upside of this card is that it has two more points for Thrive. Um, so typically Thrive caps out around like six or seven. Um, whereas because it starts at two and doesn't start at four, you have those two extra points that you can obtain, which is nice, except the condition it's, you have to meet the condition, which is the death blow. And on top of that, it needs to survive, um, and so generally, I think Necker Warrior is just going to be better. And it's not like monsters are struggling for like good bronzes. Monsters have some of the best bronzes in the game. So um, if other Thrive cards were worse, this card might see some play. But because other Thrive cards are so good, I don't think this card's going to see play. Neckers and Necker Warriors both just um, outvalued this card. So I, I don't think this card will see much play. Um, Alp. I think I covered this in another video. Um, but they've made a change. Alp is now three strength uh, from two. This was uh, this card's five provisions. Three strength was two strength, so they buffed it. Damage an enemy unit by two if Alp is under Blood Moon. Dra uh, drain an enemy instead by two. Um, so 
if you're under Blood Moon, we don't know what Blood Moon does yet, um, you get to dream. So you get to double the, the damage. Well, you get the boost on top of the damage. So it's a four-point swing plus the three bodies. So you're looking at seven value for five. Is that good? Yeah, that's good. A seven for five is really strong. Um, and it's it's not like if you kill the... It's not Death Wish 2, uh, get plus two. It's if you have Blood Moon. The, the question is, how easy is it to get Blood Moon? If you can get Blood Moon in every round, in round one, two, three, no problem, then this card is very strong. Um, you just throw it in the deck, and you go from there. If it's not that easy to get Blood Moon, then this card's going to be much harder to run. Because, I mean, if you have no Blood Moon because of the buff, it's a 5 for 5, which isn't bad. It's a fair bronze, but typically Monster doesn't like to play fair bronzes because most of Monster's bronzes are slightly on the uh, stronger side. So I, I think it'll obviously be auto... Nah, maybe because of the change, I think it will be included in every Blood Moon deck. Uh, the question is how good is Blood Moon and how good are Blood Moon decks? I don't know. Um, but I, the, the change makes it uh, much more welcoming to any kind of Blood Moon deck. So I think the card will see play. In Blood Moon. Obviously, outside of Blood Moon, this card sucks. Um, how good it'll be in Blood Moon will be uh, contingent on how easy it is to get Blood Moon. Moving along, we have Fletter. This is a monster card. I believe it is five provisions, three strength, deploy, destroy an allied unit, and gain vitality for four turns. So similar to Griffin in a Gurnacora list, uh, you destroy the Gurnacora fruit, and you get the full value on Griffin at eight. This card would be very similar. You uh, eat the one and you get the plus four, um, which means you're looking at about seven value, but not really because you're denying a fruit thrive proc. So you're looking at like six. So it's a six for five. Here's the problem. It's really conditional um, in that <clears throat> your opponent can remove the card. So if this was a four and got three vitality, uh, it would be really, really good simply because um, it would go from four to five immediately and doing five damage is really, really hard to do. Uh, the only cards that do five damage outside of like pinks from Croc and Ethne and like Brewer, uh, so like leader ticks, um, is like Serret if you have Ox in hand <clears throat> and like Donar. Um, but for the most part, dealing five damage is really, really hard to do. Um, but it's three, so it goes to four, which means it's in range for a lot of cards. Uh, Frit, Cairo, and a couple other. So, I don't think it's insane. It's fair. The problem is, once again, Monster doesn't need fair cards. They just want really good cards, because it's monsters. Uh, you could play this in an Arrakis Queen deck, which is interesting. Um, the one argument for why you would keep this in a, like, a Gurnacora list is simply because... Uh, you play a bunch of Thrive units, and the idea is, sure, they could remove this, but if they're removing this, they're not removing your other Thrive targets, which is fair. Um, but the thing is, the payoff for this doesn't seem that high, right? You're, you're getting, like, 6 for 5. Is that good? Eh, it's okay. I'd rather play a Necker Warrior that's a 4 for 4 that potentially goes up to 6 if it gets left unattended. Like, a 6 for 4 sounds much better than a... <laughs> uh like a six for five so it's okay but i i think other monster bronzes are just better so i don't think it'll see much play outside of maybe a gurnacora list uh necrat this is another monster bronze this is six provisions three strength order melee drain an enemy unit by one cooldown two whenever you play an organic card reduces units cooldown by one um yeah so if assuming it goes off, right? So you play the card, your opponent doesn't kill it or move it. Uh, you get to drain an enemy by one. So it's a two point swing uh, plus the body. So you're getting five value. So this has to go off twice for you to get good value. Um, and you can lower that cooldown with an organic card. Does monster play organic cards? No, not really. I mean, you can play a Rackus Venom. It's not bad, but do you really want to do that? Why? You just play Thrive cards. Thrive cards are better. Um, <clears throat> The problem is, it's just going to die. Like, you're playing a 6, that'll never live. 3 HP is too easy to do. Uh, 3 damage is not that hard to do. Uh, a lot of decks can do it. Any Squiatel deck can do it. Any uh, SK list can do it. Um, yeah. 
I mean, I guess in like Monster Mirrors, this card's okay, but even then, Drowner just moves it and denies it. So I think this card would be maybe playable if it didn't have the melee restriction. But because of the melee restriction, I don't think this card is even remotely playable. Um, I, I, I wouldn't even say it's a fair card. I would say it's an underwhelming engine for Monster. I don't think this card will see any play. I think this card is terrible. Um, I could be completely wrong, but. Yeah, I don't think this card is very good. Yeah. Uh, moving along, we have Dryad Matron. Uh, this is a card I revealed uh, the other day. This is a square tall card, three strength, five provisions. Every allied turn on turn end, move to the rightmost spot on the row and boost an allied unit on the left by one. So the idea of this, let's take the melee row, for example. Let's say you have, um, I don't know, a smuggler on the front row. You would play Dryad Matron to the left of smuggler. And on your turn end, it would move uh, all the way to the right and it would boost the smuggler because there's only one unit on there. Um, and then the next turn, let's say you play another smuggler. You play the smuggler to the right of Dryad Matron and then it would move again and boost that smuggler. Um, it only boosts one unit a turn. Um, they did mention in a tweet that Sentry works with this card. Sentry is a five provision, four strength square tall unit that depending on which row you place it on, uh, whenever one of your units or one of your opponent's units uh, gets moved from one row to another, uh, it either boosts or damages it. So this isn't moving rows, it's moving within a row. So technically, Sentry should not boost it, but they said that it will. So I guess they're going to rework Sentry, like the card text on it. Basically, whenever a card moves would be my guess. So Sentry actually works on this, which is pretty funny. Um, also, another side note, if you have two of these on the board, uh, they just cycle on each other so the first one would move and buff the uh the rightmost card before this card moves uh, and then the next dryad matron would move over to the right uh, and buff the first one and then even when you pass it'll keep going so they'll, they'll continuously buff and get you two points a turn uh throw a sentry in there and you're getting an additional two points throw another sentry in there and you're getting an additional two points so if you get two of dryad matrons on the board and two sentries on the board uh, and your opponent doesn't remove them, you're looking at six points a turn. Is that good? Yeah, it's pretty good. Six points a turn is a lot of points. Um, uh, and it's all bronzes. It's all five uh, provision bronzes. So it's a pretty... I mean, it's not super easy to set up because it's four specific cards you need, but uh, in theory, if you get it, it's a lot of points a turn. Um, yeah, so I, I think this card is pretty good. It's immediately a four for five. Uh, I think it'll be good in a filler deck simply because you just fill it and then it's uh, harder to kill. I, I think you do kind of want to play this with Sentry. I think you want to lead with a Sentry um, just to make it so that when you play this, it comes out at four, uh, making it a little harder to kill. Um, and yeah, I, I think this card will see play. I don't think it's broken. I don't think it'll be auto-included in every Squiatel deck. Um, but I do think it's very strong. Uh, it's probably one of the strongest, if not the strongest, Squiatel engine. Yeah. Good card. I like it a lot. Uh, we covered these. Hen Gate Sword. So this is a neutral card, nine provisions. This is an artifact. Uh, deploy damage an enemy unit by two death blows. Spawn and play a copy of the destroyed unit. So... Uh, you could, if you really wanted to, you could play Sabrina on your opponent's side of the board... Uh, pass, come back to your turn, play Gated Sword on Sabrina, kill the Sabrina, Sabrina procs, uh, and then you get to play another Sabrina on your opponent's side of the board. Um, which just sounds like a really complicated lacerate for nine provisions. Yeah, not good. That combo's terrible. Um, I don't think this card is very good. Uh, the, the best case scenario would be something like your opponent plays a Yutta. Oh, no. Your opponent plays like a Spear Tip. You do 10 damage to the spear tip, and then you play Gated Sword. You kill the spear tip, and then you get to make one of your own spear tips. That's pretty good. Um, the problem is, how do you do 10 damage to a spear tip? Also, <laughs> what if you don't queue into monsters, right? Um, so maybe this card is good if people are running like uh, a lot of low strength, high provision uh, units that have really good uh, deploy effects. An example would be like Zoltan. Uh, if Zoltan starts seeing a lot of play, I, I guess this card's pretty good. It, like, counters Zoltan. Um, 
Uh, yeah, I, I don't think it's that good. The the only other case where I think this card could see play is if Uni Cairo is still super popular uh, and still like 60-70% of uh, the meta in all decks. Um, then you could play Uni Cairo as well and then you would play this in like an Ethne or a Bruver deck. Uh, you would play your Uni or your Cairo uh, and then the next turn you would ping their Uni or Cairo down to two with either two Ethne ticks or like a Bruver tick. And then you play Gate of Sword, uh, and then you get to replay one of their uh, Uni or Cairo to get the uh, the double effect. So, in that scenario, it's 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 okay, but yeah, it, it's kind of contingent on people still running Uni Cairo um, or a very specific meta where people are running cards like Zoltan. So, other than very niche meta scenarios, I don't think this card's going to see a lot of play. Uh, but I think this is the first artifact we've ever seen that isn't like an engine type of artifact. Uh, other than like a trap artifact where you play it and you immediately get the effect uh, and then that's it so eh, it's kind of cool but i don't think it's going to see a lot of play uh saying Greel, this is a neutral card seven provisions boost a unit by six and give it a shield so a similar card is swallow potion swallow potion is six provisions boost a unit by six this has shield attached to it so you're paying one provision for a shield is that good it's okay. Um, here's the problem. Shield is a good mechanic for engines, right? So something like Artificer, you play this on your ranged row, uh, and then the next unit you play like an engine, uh, you give that unit a shield to increase its survivability. Uh, Sangreal, you kind of have to play after you play that initial card, um, which makes it kind of awkward. Um, because typically you want the shield immediately after you play the engine. So playing this on an engine doesn't really make a lot of sense. Um, you could play this, some people were saying like you could play this with Salt Kirk, which doesn't make a lot of sense because, okay, let's say you play Salt Kirk for five, you move boost it to six, you throw Sangreal on it. Um, it's at 12 strength. With shield, you can kill a 24 strength unit, right? You hit the unit for 12, it hits back for nothing because the shield blocks it, and then you hit it again for 12. It's a 24 point uh salt kirk plus plus the salt kirk body uh, and the sangreal cost but how many 24s are there the only 24 i can think of is arrakis queen uh and like a large slizzard or like glusty so eh, it's a scenario that's not going to happen you'd be better off just playing salt kirk me boosting it and giving it a shield with like artificer and then killing like a spear tip or something um so even that scenario is not even that good the only scenario where I see this card seeing play is a uh, King Rogner list. So King Rogner basically makes all the shields that you own or all your opponent's shields as well, uh, plus three, right? So you get three per shield. So assuming you play this in that list and the shield doesn't get ticked off, the shield is worth three, right? So this is worth nine for six. So in a King Rogner list, I think this card's fine just because it's another shield, and another shield is good. So, uh, it's okay in a King Rogner list. Outside of a King Rogner list, I, I don't see why you'd play this card. Yeah, but it is a cool card. I like the art. Um, yeah, may maybe there's some crazy engine. I don't know. I, I guess it synergizes with, like, Windhelm. But, yeah, I don't think this card's very good. Uh, Vivian Oriole. This is 10 provisions, neutral, 1 strength, deploy, destroy enemy artifact, and boost self by its cost. Um, <laughs> there's been a lot of discussions about this card. Slima posted a tweet basically saying, you guys haven't seen all the cards yet. Be patient. Um, yeah. In From what we know right now, as of today, uh, this card sucks. Right, you compare it to Primordial Dao, uh, typically it's going to get worse value unless you remove something like Summoning Circle. Um, but we haven't seen all the cards, so it is too early to give this card any kind of rating or yeah, opinion. So I am not going to evaluate this card because... We don't have all the information yet, and it seems like we do, in fact, need some more information, some more context before evaluating this card. So, um, we'll see. 
Moving on, Vivian. Uh, we actually cover this. Gael. This is a uh, seven provision monster card, three strength, deployed damage an enemy unit by one death blow, boost self by the destroyed enemy's base power. So best case scenario, your opponent plays a spear tip, you do 11 damage to the spear tip, and then you play this, you kill the spear tip, and you get plus 12 on this, you get 16 value for seven. Wow. Yeah. Um, good luck with that. Uh, you could play your own spear tip and then play, I don't know, fork tail, bring it down to 11, and then they play spear tip, then you cyclops your spear tip into their spear tip, hopefully they don't buff it, and then you get all of that. That's super complicated. Um, way too many steps, contingent on your opponent playing in like the exact order you wanted them to. Um, that's not really how you're supposed to play this card. The, the way you play this card, uh, I mean, Cyclops works, I guess. You can throw like fours into fives or whatever. Uh, but really, the way you play this card is with bleed. Um, so bleed is you give a unit bleed, and then every turn it takes uh, one point of damage. So the idea would be you give like a six strength unit, or I guess a seven strength unit, like six bleed. Six turns later, when it's at one, you play this, right? So the idea is you bleed them, and once they're about to die, you play this card and kill it, uh, and you get the boost. So I think this card is good in a bleed deck. I think this card is very good in a bleed deck. Um, the question is, is how good is bleed? I don't know. I have no idea. It's contingent on so many different things. Uh, one of the biggest things is purify. If purify is everywhere, bleed sucks, like, a lot. Because you play bleed, right? If you play the six bleed card and your opponent purifies it you got well, zero right because i'm pretty sure bleed is end of turn i think I, maybe it's start of turn okay let's say it's start of turn uh you bleed for one uh and it purifies so i, I don't think bleed is going to be that good so if bleed isn't good then i don't think this card is good but maybe bleed is secretly really good if bleed is really good then this card is really good so i, I guess this is very contingent on whether or not bleed sees a lot of play yep moving along fisher king this is a neutral card seven provisions for strength deploy range put any card from your deck at the top um so this is a neutral albrick albrick is uh seven provisions three strength boost a unit by two and put it on top of the deck um albrick is strictly better most of the time simply because well Three plus two is five, and five is bigger than four. Uh, and it provides two points of carryover, which is important if you ever play Albrick in round one or two. Um, so in those cases, Albrick is better. The cases where King Fisher is better is when you put a special on top of your deck. So if you put something like Yorvith's Gambit or um, Commander's Horn on top of your deck, uh, then all of a sudden Fisher King is better because then you're getting four, whereas Albrick only gets three. So depending on what card you're putting on top will determine which card is better um but this card is neutral so it means you can play it in any deck um the the decks that want to play a card like this are decks that are combo oriented um or decks that play really expensive uh cards that are kind of like finishers such as well <laughs> gambit or horn um i like the card uh, it also means, so right now, if you want to play those expensive cards, what you typically do is you play a lot of thinning. You play very aggressive thinning, like Witchers and Roach is the most common one. Uh, and then, like, let's say if you're Monsters, you can play Riders. If you're Squayatel, you can play, I mean, Volunteers are starting to see play now with, uh, like, Agitators and Skirmishers. So you, you play a bunch of thinning so that you increase your odds of finding uh, those high expensive cards. So Fisher King kind of allows you to deviate from that. Uh, it means you don't have to play Witchers and Roach, and you could just play this card. And Well, granted, you do have to draw the card, right, in round one or two. If you don't draw the card in round one or two, it kind of sucks. Um, I mean, I guess it's really a lot of cards. But, uh, yeah, so I, I like the card. It's good for combo decks. Um, it might allow decks to not run Witchers and Roach for consistency reasons, which, I mean, I'm a fan of that. So I like the card. I'm glad it's in the game. Um, I don't think it's OP. I think it's a card that will see play, but by no means auto-include. It's just a solid card. Moving on, we have Shelmar. I believe, yes, I have not talked about this card yet. This is a new Nilfgaard card. Nine provisions, four strength. Uh, deploy melee damage a Nilfgaardian enemy unit by seven. Deploy range boost self by two for every non-Nilfgaardian unit uh, from your opponent's faction under your control. 
So this card is interesting. When it was first released, pe people were talking about playing this on something like a spy, right? You could play Joaquim on your opponent's side of the board, and you could play uh, Shalmar and kill the Joaquim or kill Joaquim. It's not very good. Uh, another thing you could do is you could play Operator on like a Nilf Guardian Knight and then kill the Nilf Guardian Knight. That's not very good either. Um, <laughs> it's not really how you're supposed to play this card. Uh, the idea of this card is the second ability. Range boost self by two for every Nilf Guardian unit or non Nilf Guardian unit from your opponent's faction. So th this is how you're supposed to use the card. You put this in an Assimilate deck. Um, you play a bunch of cards from your opponent's faction. Um, you play cards like Cantarella and hopefully other cards that potentially play cards from your opponent's faction so that uh, Simulate goes off. Uh, and then you, this is kind of like the finisher for the deck. You get plus two per card. Um, the reason why the melee ability is in there is because, well, you, you don't really want to play a four. So it, it's it's slid in there so that it doesn't brick in the Nilfgaard matchup. So, um, but that's not really how you're supposed to use it. It's the second ability. Is this card good? Um, so you're looking at four for nine. So if you're using it for the second ability, which you should be, uh, you need to have three units, right? Uh, you get six, and then it goes to 10. How hard will it be to get three units from your opponent's faction on your side of the board? I think it's too early to tell. I don't think we have enough cards to say, but uh, I, I think this card will be good in an assimilate deck. I think it'll be auto included in that deck. Um, outside of that deck, I don't think this card will see much play. So, good card for Assimilate decks. Yeah. Moving on, we have Corrupted Flaminka. This card is a SK card, 6 provisions, 4 strength, deploy, destroy an allied beast to the right, then boost self by its power, and give an enemy unit bleeding for a number of turns equal to the destroyed beast power. So, um, this has a cap of well the highest beast in the game which i guess would be something like olaf if you throw ta on it you could get it to like 13 wow bleed 13 problem is there aren't 13 turns in a round right plus you have to play the card so you're, you're looking at like best case scenario you can bleed like eight right you play olaf your opponent plays a spear tip you chuck the old Olaf into it and you get eight turns of bleed assuming they never pass um so that, that's like best case scenario so you're looking at something like what 12 value is that good i mean a 12 for six is really good the question is how often is that going to happen and the answer is not very often uh, we discussed earlier bleed is kind of a iffy mechanic i'm not too sold on it yet so i think typically you're going to be throwing something like a savage bear or something to proc your other savage bear or some other beast um it's not really engine removal because it takes multiple turns to proc your opponent can like purify or just boost a unit out of the bleed range um some people have been saying it works with Morkvarg, right? You play Morkvarg and then you throw Morkvarg into it and your other Morkvarg comes back. Oh, it's so good. Eh, not really. Um, the reason why I don't think that's a good play is because why would you want to play a five-point Morkvarg when you could just get the five-point Morkvarg for free from discarding? It's not like SK has a limited amount of discard, right? Discarding Morkvarg is very easy to do. Um... So I, I don't even think that scenario is very good. You just discard more card, right? Um, so I'm not a huge fan of this card. I don't think it's that good. I, I think it might see a little bit of play in Beast SK. It's okay. I mean, if you chuck a Beast in round three, it increases your Bear Master value by one, or your Beast Master value by one, and you have like two of those, so you get like two points extra, which is kind of cute. So I guess in like a Beast SK list, it's okay. But outside of a Beast SK list, eh... I'm not seeing it. I'm not seeing it. Uh, moving on. This is a four strength, nine provision card. Um, neutral. Deploy melee, damage an enemy unit by one, death blow, boost self by six, and gain a shield. So originally it was boost self by four, and the card sucked because it was a nine for nine with shield. Best case scenario, worst case was a five. That's really bad. Um, I would rather just play like a Unicorn or a Chironex. That's an 8 for 9 100% of the time. Um, but they changed it. They made it boost 6. So best case scenario, um, you kill something that has 1 HP, uh, it becomes an 11 for 9. Is an 11 for 9 good? Yeah, that's really good. You're getting 2 extra, not to mention the shield. Um, typically, 
Shield is for engine protection, so I don't think the shield matters too much um, against like a control deck that plays like pings. That could be pretty annoying. So the shield, I would say shield is probably worth like 0.3 to 0.5 provisions. I would not put shield at a value of one provision, no. Um, but the extra shield is nice. But you, you play this because it's an 11 for nine, which is way above average, um, especially on a, a nine. Um, the comparison is like a, a unicorn or Chironex so that's uh, eight for nine. Um, so this card's really good. Um, the problem would be, well, if you don't kill a unit, it's a five for nine, which is really bad. So it, it's a risk reward card, but the reward is actually worth it because it is above average. Um, so this card will definitely see play in Ethne list because you play Ethne. Uh, Scoia'tael has a ton of damage on their cards, Panther, Archers. Uh, sword masters skirmishers tons of cards that do uh damage so you can play this after the those cards uh, or you could simply use ethne to bring like a two down to one and then play this um it also works in bruver because well bruver is also a square tail leader and you also have all those cards that damage not to mention uh bruver you can bring a three down to one and then play this uh this might see some play in sk i say some because crack can ping a unit from two to one but once again, it's very dependent on how many twos are being run. If not a lot of twos are being run, then this card's not very good in crack. Uh, you could play it with light long ship, but then you're walking into, well, then you need a light long ship, you need a crack ping, and you need to have this. A little risky, but maybe maybe they can get away with it. Um, maybe they start running like Mastercrafted Spears again for this card. Unlikely, but it's possible. Another note, uh, Neckers. This card's very good against Neckers. Your opponent plays a Neckers. You just get to instantly play this to remove one of their fire targets and you get the buff. So that's really, really strong. Um, and the last archetype faction that this could be good in is uh, Spy Nilfgaard. So Spy Nilfgaard, you have Emissaries and Cantarella, which are one-point spies that you play on your opponent's side of the board. Um, and then you can kill them with this. So maybe you play this in that deck. Uh, the question is how good is Spy Nilfgaard? Uh, apparently we're getting one more Spy in the upcoming expansion, or this expansion. So maybe Spy Nilfgaard sees play. If Spy Nilfgaard sees play, I definitely think this card will see play. But uh, this card, I think, is best in Scoia'tael because Scoia'tael has the most uh, damage on their units and their leaders. So very, very strong card. auto include in like every Ethne. Uh, Brewer, I'm not sure, but every Ethne deck, unless you're playing Scorch. Very strong card. Love this card. Uh, moving on, Musicians of Blaviken. This is a neutral, four strength, six provisions to play randomly, gain either a shield, immunity, resilience, or poison. Um, this is like the meme card of the expansion. The problem is, one of those things that is useful, the resilience, right? The comparison is Mahakam. I'm blanking on the name. Uh... I can't remember. Seven provisions, four strength and square toss. This card's boosted, uh, gain resilience. Um, I can't remember the name. Anyway, this is similar to that. The difference is it's a 25% chance to roll resilience, uh, and the other options are garbage. So getting poison does nothing because I don't think poison's going to be very good. Getting immunity does nothing because immunity is good on, like, engines right with avalok onto like visigoda or something uh it's also good on like carryover but the problem is immunity by itself on a four isn't that good i mean we have a werewolf right now which is a monster card which is a four for four with immunity and that card sees very little play um and then shield shield is good in a king rogner list so um there are two decks i think this card could see play um, that is a King Rogner list because you have a 50% to get good value, right? 50% or 25% of the time you get resilience, which is just good. Uh, four with resilience is very strong. 25% um, of the time you get shield, which is very good for King Rogner. So, uh, and it makes it a seven for four, which is pretty good. So it's okay in a King Rogner list. I don't know if it'll make the cut, but I mean, it's, it's okay, I guess. Um, and a beast SK list because it is a beast, um, Generally, you like playing Beast in a Beast SK list, um, and you just hope for the 25% on Resilience, um, because if you hit it, it's phenomenal. If you don't hit it, well, it's a Beast. It's not that bad, right? I play uh, the Cow card in my decks. It's six provision, one strength, order, turn into a 10. Um, it's not even that bad. So I think this card will see some play in King Rogner or Beast SK, maybe. 
Um, but yeah, outside of those two decks, this card's a mean card, and it's not going to see much play. <clears throat> Moving on, Monster. This is nine provisions. Queen of the Night. Deploy melee. Give an enemy unit bleeding for four turns. Deploy ranged purify unit. So, um, oh, sorry, this is eight provisions. So if you use the bleed and all four bleed procs go off, you're looking at a nine for eight. Is that good? Yeah, it's not bad. Um, but once again, how good is bleeding? So in a bleeding deck, this card auto includes because it's very good, and you have the flexibility of purifying a unit, which means you can remove lock from one of your cards. You can re remove vitality from one of your opponent's cards. Maybe you're playing an Arrakis Queen deck and you play Ruhin and they lock it. You could purify it to unlock it. Um, I, I think if you're playing this card, you're playing it for the bleed. Unless, of course, you're playing something like Arrakis Queen and you play cards like Slizzard or Ruhin and you can utilize to purify. So I think it's a good card. The flexibility is nice. The art works great. Um, it's a good card. Yeah. Will it see a lot of play? I don't know. Once again, I don't know how good a bleed deck is. Um, having a free unlock is actually pretty good. At one point, I was playing uh, Ale, her Mahaka Male, in my Arrakis Queen list because I wanted to unlock my uh, engine. So, I mean, this is strictly better. So, yeah, I, I, I could see it seeing play. It's a pretty decent card. Uh, we talked about this. Paul Marin. Uh, this is a Nilfgaardian card. This is eight provisions, five strength, deploy, damage an enemy unit by two, death blow, give adjacent allied unit shield. If Milton is in your hand, trigger death blow on deploy. Milton, we don't know what he does, but my guess is he's similar uh, in terms of like P cost and strength cost, similar to like Ox Serret. I guess Ox Serret are different provision costs, so maybe not necessarily same provision cost, but um, it's a similar effect in that if you have one, you get an additional effect. Except in this case, it's not an additional effect. Well, at least on this card, it's not an additional effect. It's just it bypasses the need for death blow, right? Um, so if you play this without Milton in your hand, it's a five that deals two. So you're getting seven for eight value. Is that good? Yeah, it's fair. I mean, like a frit is a eight for nine. This is a seven for eight. It's not bad. The only thing is doing four damage is better than dealing two damage because four damage removes engines, two damage does not really remove engines unless like your opponent's a thrive list with monsters. Um, so I don't think the two damage is very meaningful. Um, and give adjacent units shields. Here's the problem with shields that we've discussed several times in this video. You want to play shields ahead of time or you want to play a unit with uh, the ability to give shields like Artificer ahead of time or Watchman, uh, and then you play the engine and then you give it shield. This doesn't really work like that. You would have to play the engines first and then follow it up with this. Um, so a scenario I can think of is, let's say your opponent has an Efrit and you have a Nausicaa Brigade, you play the Nausicaa Brigade at three, your opponent doesn't kill it because it's like, well, once it goes to four, I can just kill it at Efrit so I can wait a turn. All right, they wait that turn. Uh, you play this card and you give it shield. Oh no, your opponent can't kill it anymore. Sure, that'll work on like day one or something. The problem is after day one, if that actually becomes a thing, people will just automatically kill it and then it'll never get that shield. So yeah, I don't think it's that good. I, I, I don't think giving units shield in Nilfgaard is very strong. I think shield will strictly be an NR thing because keeping engines alive in NR is super, super good. Um, I don't think you need to keep engines alive in uh, Nilfgaard. The only other thing would be something like... I don't know. You, you give Zoltan like a shield so that you can play Vivian on it later. It doesn't even sound that good. I don't know. That's, that's so gimmicky. We'll see. We'll see. Obviously, it's very... like well, Depending on what Milton's ability is, if Milton's ability is like insane, it's like death blow give adjacent units plus two or something so it has like the same body then it's like crazy good then maybe um but uh, yeah we'll see the the effect on him right now is not very good so we'll have to wait uh and the last card the great oak this is a new squatel card this card is 13 provisions eight strength deploy damage an enemy unit by the number of cards to the left of self then boost self by the number of cards to the right so the max amount of units you can have on a row is nine so the max value you can get out of this is eight plus eight. Um, either eight boost, eight damage, or a combination of the two. So um, 
Is that good? You're looking at a 16 for 13 in best case scenario. Yeah, that's pretty good. A 16 for 13 is really strong. Uh, we have Spear Tip right now in Monster, which is a 12 for 15. Um, this is a 13. And getting 12 value out of this is actually not that hard. You have to play four units. I think you can manage to play four units. Even in a short round three, if you played all your cards in round two, you would play two units and then this card, which means it would be getting 10 value. And that's the worst, worst case scenario. I, I guess it's worse if they remove both of them and it's only an eight. Um, but it has the upside of 16, which is a really big number, especially for Scoia'tael. Scoia'tael... Scoia'tael can't do that. Scoia'tael doesn't have 16. Like, the closest thing it has to that is, like, Francesca into Commander's Horn or something. Um, or something like Crushing Trap and your opponent plays nine units on a row. Um, but those are contingent on a bunch of things, whereas this is not as much. So I, I think on average you're looking at like 12 to 14 value on this card, which is really strong. And you have the flexibility of removing an engine, right? If your opponent plays like a unicorn and you need to kill it, you just play Great Oak. Um, you do four damage and then boost off by two if you have six units on the board. Um, so there's a lot of flexibility on this. The one downside to this card is it is a tall unit, right? So if people are running tall removal, you're walking into tall removal, which isn't necessarily a good thing. Um, but, but where this card shines is an Ethne or a Philavandralist. So Ethne and Philavandralist, they typically play something, well, Philavandralist always play three cards in round one and then dry pass or pass and then go into a long round two. Uh, the length is dependent on how long your opponent decides to push you. Um, I have played a good amount of this deck and what I found is towards the end of a round two, your opponent starts playing high tempo cards like Commander's Horn or like a Spear Tip. Uh, and you don't have a card to match that tempo and punish them for bleeding you. Well, Great Oak is that answer. Um, the longer the round goes, the more value you're getting out of Great Oak. Uh, the easier it is to catch up if they play that large swing card. So I think this card is very good in the Phil Evangel list. I think it's pretty good in the Ethne list too, because uh, stacking the melee row is not that hard. A lot of um, the cards in an Ethne list stack on melee anyways. So... I think this just fits right in uh, the ethne list that I'm currently running. I'm just going to drop Scorch and play this card because it's, it's just a good card. Um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to this card. The artwork is great. It's a nice finisher for Scoia'tael, which is something that they've been lacking for like two years. Scoia'tael typically does not have finishers. So I uh, really, really like this card. It's by no means auto-include because uh, hitting that many units on a row can be hard to do. Um, but I do think it is a very strong card. So yeah, I th think that's it. I might have missed a card. I hope I didn't. Um, I will do a quick scan through. I don't think I missed any cards. So um, let me know what you guys think about the cards. Uh, I apologize that this video is a little longer. I kept putting it off um, for different reasons. So a little bit of a longer video, uh, a couple more cards than the uh, other two reviews, but uh, yeah. Let me know what you guys think about the upcoming cards, and I'll see you guys on the next video.